Okay, uh, it's two or two right now. Let's get started. So hello everyone, welcome to ASIC seminar um, series. I'm John, the seminar coordinator. I will be moderating this seminar with uh, Kathy Medley, our communication specialist. And um, today our director, Ralph, is not here, so I will be doing the introduction uh, for our speaker. And um, please feel free to um, ask any questions after the presentation. You can do so by uh, unmuting yourself, or you can chat us your questions, uh, and we will read it out. So today, uh, we are very delighted to have um, Professor um, Schroden uh, coming from Stanford. And um, he is an associate professor uh, of the Department of Geophysics um, and Electrical Engineering at Stanford University. Uh, where he is also a Bass University Fellow uh, in undergraduate education, a senior fellow with Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, and a senior member with the uh, um, KFD Institute uh, for Particle Astrophysics and um, Cosmology. And um, Professor Schroeder's research uh, is primarily focused on observing and understanding the roles of continental ice sheets and their contribution to the rate of sea level rise uh, with a secondary focus on the um, ice um, at the subsurface exploration of icy moons. Uh, he also um, studies the uh, development and use um, and analysis of geophysical radar remote sensing systems that are optimized to observe um, hypothesis specific phenomena. Um, and he got new, numerous um, roles um, as well as uh, a lot of um, play a lot of roles um, at the university and also the community level. Um, so I'm going to I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, and he was with uh, NASA's JPL um, before coming to Stanford and receiving his um, PhD. Um, in geophysics um, from uh, University of um, Texas in Austin. So I'm going to turn this over to Professor Schroeder um, and let's look forward to this um, exciting um, talk. So um, Professor, please proceed. Great, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to virtually be with you all. Um, I'll try and get through the talk so that there's some time for questions and interactivity and feel free to interrupt me. Um, my goal here is to just share with y'all uh, how we can use ice penetrating radar to sort of probe subsurface processes, both on ice sheets and icy moons. My group is split, as am I, between geophysics and electrical engineering. The geophysicists use radar data to try and understand ice sheets and icy moons and how they work. And my engineers invent new radar systems to observe ice. Um, and then a, a lot of the group is sort of in the middle in a signal processing dom domain where we have students from both sides. So I'll try and give you sort of vignettes of each of those, um, and then we can go from there. So I, like any other glaciologist who give you a talk, start my talk with questions of sea level rise. Uh, the plot on the left is uh, from the IPCC. It's the range of uncertainty and sea level rise in models over the next 100 years. Uh, and the plot on the left is past sea level rise. And, uh, and the thing that's most striking to me is that uh, the current rate of sea level is that solid line. That's not that exceptional for, you know, what the Earth has done in the past. Um, and even our steepest slopes, which are, are sort of our most pessimistic scenarios in terms of sea level rise from models, there's that dashed line. So it's not the highest amount of sea level the Earth has been capable of in, uh, in the past. Given how consequential sea level rise is and how uncertain it is both in the models and in its history. Uh, you know, there's questions of why why aren't we better at this? Um, for me, I think one of the main reasons we're not better at this uh, is uh, that our remote sensing techniques that give us our richest, certainly spatially richest observations of the ice sheet, um, all just look at the surface. Optical imagery, surface velocity, laser altimetry, they're all looking at the surface of the ice sheet and not the subsurface where many of the key processes are taking place. So that's where my field of radio glaciology comes in. Uh, in our case, we use ice penetrating radars, mostly carried by airplanes uh, that fly along like this cute illustration on the right, send pulses down and make vertical profiles. So this is different than imaging radars that look sideways and make maps. This makes vertical profiles. Um, 
And most of the data historically for our field was collected with airplanes like that on the left. This is a DC-3 airplane uh, that has the antenna. You can see the, the red antenna underneath the wing. So it's about the size, you know, so it's a fraction of the wing, sends the pulses down, comes back, and you get these cross sections. When you look at these cross sections, like the one on the top there, which is about 400 kilometers long and about four kilometers thick, you can see the ice sheet, the continent underneath the ice sheet on the bottom. You can see these layers throughout the ice sheet, which are isochrones generally, uh, and give you a sense of sort of the structure of the ice sheet and past ice flow. Uh, and then if you take all of these profiles that are collected together over half a century by every nation who does this sort of thing, which is those lines on the bottom left. You grid them together and you can make maps like the bottom right, which is uh, the continental topography without the continent, uh, the ice sheet on top. And this is what's used in ice sheet model projections like those I showed earlier. This is mostly how our community uses this data. There are other groups, including my group, who also look at the radar echo itself as a signal to diagnose conditions inside and beneath the ice sheet. So for example, that radiogram in the top left, that's a subglacial lake, that flat bit there in the middle, the subglacial mountain to the left. Uh, the lake is flat, as will be most lakes you will have encountered in your life for the same reason. So that's one way we know it's a lake. The other way we know it's a lake is how bright the reflection is. So this is the reflection coefficient that comes from the difference of the velocity of the radar and ice versus the bed. And in the table in the bottom there, you can see the range of reflectivities range over 40 dB, right? So that's 10 to the fourth, so that's 10,000 times brighter. So that's one of the things that makes us confident in some of our interpretations of subglacial conditions is a signal that's 10,000 times brighter. You could be wrong about a lot and still see that. Um, the reason it's not trivial uh, to look at those reflectivities is the plot on the right is the attenuation. And the attenuation is very temperature dependent. You can see on the bottom left where it's extremely cold, uh, at least for Earth, not for space. Um, the attenuation rates are like single digit dBs per kilometer, very low loss. As you get up towards uh, temperatures where you get liquid water, even at a small level in the ice, you get attenuation rates that are like above 50 dB per kilometer. So the challenge is separating these signals of if you see a strong reflection from the subsurface, how much of that is the ice being, say, less attenuating, and how much of it is the bed being more reflective? If you use these combinations of attenuation, reflectivity, and some signal character, um, you can move beyond those simple images of maps of bed topography and uh, ice sheet structure and start to look at these processes that occur within the ice sheet. And so in you know recent years, Folks, including our groups, but also others, uh, have uh, studied any number of these processes, uh, whether you're looking at subglacial groundwater systems, water at the ice bed interface, the temperature of the ice itself, crystal fabric, or on the coast, uh, water intruding under the bed, or basal crevassing, or marine ice. So these are all things that have signatures in ice penetrating radar. Okay, so that's, that's sort of the tool and the way to think about these signatures. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about glaciers and places with names you might have heard of. Um, the Waste Glacier, uh, in the news a lot, it's configured to be uh, the most potentially unstable glacier in West Antarctica because of its landward sloping bed. It's the fastest changing glacier right now. Uh, we just ended a large multi-year international collaboration uh, where people could only propose to study Thwaites Glacier, and there was a, a wide number of projects, including boats, airplanes, uh, teams on the ground. Um, we participated in the TIME project, which is a ground-based geophysics campaign along uh, the eastern shear margin. But everybody's looking at Thwaites because we think it's the most likely uh, to trigger large-scale retreat. While I think that's right to focus on Thwaites, I think there's also a little bit of, of context around Thwaites, its neighbor um, Pine Island Glacier. It's actually one of the next most uh, rapidly changing, potentially unstable glaciers. And if you look at that plot on the left, this is vertical velocity showing ice flow. And you know, ice flows is a viscous fluid. Um, that bit that I've circled there, the Bentley Trench, it's weird that it's shaped that way, right? Like I wouldn't think if something was a fluid flowing that there'd be the sort of this tumor of ice flowing out of Pine Island. So that's one weird thing about that area. 
Another thing that's weird is if you look at uh, subglacial water routing models where water would flow underneath the ice sheet because of topography and overlying pressure, that same area, uh, the water should flow through Thwaites and not Pine Island. So that's also uncommon for glaciers. Normally the subglacial water and the ice are flowing in similar directions. The reason that I think this super consequential area that sits at the boundary of two of the most important, largest, most rapidly changing glaciers in West Antarctica, uh, that we don't know why this boundary is where it is, is that it's also at the boundary of two surveys. So you can see on the right, uh, the survey in brown, that's a survey that was conducted by the British Antarctic Survey with a radar with center frequency, I think around 150 megahertz um, and an interleaved pulse design. Uh, the purple survey is a radar operated by the University of Texas with the 60 megahertz chirped radar system with high and low gain systems, um, but a single transmit pulse length. Uh, so these are two separate systems and this area at the boundary of the glaciers is also at a boundary between different data types and radar systems. And I think that's why we have not historically understood this boundary. Fortunately, my group includes both scientists and engineers who are interested in both understanding the glaciers and going through the process of cross calibrating these systems. So uh, we are fortunate to have these lines on the left that were flown by both systems at the same time. We went through a lot of work cross calibrating those systems and produced this reflectivity map on the right. Now, you know from earlier that the that table of reflectivity is the most reflective stuff is stuff that is wet uh, and thawed. And the least reflective stuff is stuff that is frozen, like frozen beds. You see, and see that circle at that boundary is a piece where the ice sheet is frozen to the bed. And the reason the ice is flowing around it from the way it's there is you have this piece of ice frozen to the bed. But if we're trying to understand the long-term stability of this boundary between the glaciers, probably being frozen to the bed is not a terribly permanent state of affairs on the scale of ice sheets. And so you could imagine that thawing and moving, for example. Okay. If you're not convinced that a piece of ice frozen into the bed is going to determine the boundary between these glaciers in the long term. Uh, you could look for other things that set the boundary. So, for example, the eastern shear margin of Thwaites is here. You can see all these black lines on bed topography. Shear margins are where you have fast ice flowing next to slow ice. And you can see most of these margins, except for the eastern shear margin that's in the zoom in, uh, flow around bed topographic highs or subglacial volcanoes, you could imagine drawing those margins where they are. The eastern shear margin, which again is this boundary between Thwaites and Pine Island, it's extremely weird that it's there. I would never draw a margin there. You can see it's going from low topography across some highlands, very strange. So probably it's not the shape of the bed setting that boundary. It's so strange that uh, we participated in a, a project. Um, I just had a student coming back from months camping on the ice to try and answer why that margin is where it is. So one of the key leading hypotheses we were testing is whether it's perhaps the temperature of the ice that you have a layer due to friction and the margin, frictional heating, temperate ice, softer ice that uh, controls the position of the margin. So to do this, uh, we wanted to do a sort of tomographic survey. You know from earlier that the attenuation rate is temperature dependent. So you can imagine warmer ice would absorb more energy. And so a survey like that in the bottom left would be attractive. The challenge with this is this has offsets of uh, many kilometers. And the existing radar systems that we could have used to do this uh, required cables. Um, and as a result, uh, you would have needed kilometers of coaxial cable, which would have given you tons of attenuation and dispersion. Uh, so my groups developed two separate radar systems to test this. Uh, you can see in the bottom right, these sets of variable offset polar metric surveys that were done. The bottom left is a sophomore defined radio system that one of my former uh, engineering students, Nicole Beinart, uh, who's now at the University of Colorado developed to eavesdrop on a stationary radar with software defined radio and use the direct path of the signal to synchronize the signal uh, to allow you to coherently sum the radar. On the right is a fiber optic system uh, developed by my current student, Danny, who's pictured there laying down with these big spools of fiber. And that allows us to use totally synchronized systems, uh, converts the radar signal into light, sends it over fiber over tens of kilometers back into radar signal back through the ice um, and do imaging that way. So Danny just came back from the field a couple of months ago, is analyzing this data to try and answer these questions of, is there a warm pocket of tempered ice that governs that margin? Okay, 
So maybe he'll find it's governed by tempered ice. Maybe he won't. Um, in either case, uh, the warmth of ice in the shear margin is also something that you can imagine might be temporary or not like strongly permanently controlling things. So you say, okay, is there anything else that could be setting this boundary between the glaciers? So we go further downstream, you see the Eastern ice shelf of Thwaites. Uh, you can see in the plot on the left, all these areas that are red that are uh, melting, accelerating, thinning. And then you have this one ice shelf in blue uh, that is slowing down. And we know that that's because as the ice shelf goes afloat, it's regrounded on a piece of high topography on the ocean floor. So, so you could imagine maybe that sets the boundary between these two glaciers and pushing the ice back there from the ocean side. Um, in our field, uh, this plot on the right counts as data rich, uh, where we have two flight lines from 2009 and one flight line um, from 1979 that cross each other. So that's actually very lucky that 1979 line is one of the only lines in this entire sector of the ice sheet and happens to have crossed uh, that ice shelf. Uh, so we went with our group uh, early on in the, in the history of my group here, we bought this scanner you can see in the top our bottom left, which is meant for retouching old Hollywood films. Um, and we went uh, to the Scott Polar Research Institute Museum at the University of Cambridge, where they had these records from the 70s in a thousand of those cylinders of 35 millimeter optical film. So two of my uh, friends who had studied our history and I went, um, we uh, put on gloves, reeled these things together and scanned, produced 2 million images. Uh, from the film in order to do this comparison. You can see the plot on the right. Uh, you can see the original published paper in the top uh, of the subglacial lake. And then you can see our scan on the bottom. That's the same piece of film, same piece of data, much higher resolution. And you can even see on the high resolution scan, that little dark mark, that's a piece of masking tape that was put there 50 years ago. Is that a nature paper right there? Uh, so once we scanned that and had all those images, we were able to compare over the ice shelf uh, what it looks like. You can see circled in red, this is that regrounding area. And you can see that in the 70s, it regrounded then went afloat again on the other side. So it was uh, sort of stably regrounded there, or at least more, more substantially regrounded. You can see in the smaller circles in 2009 that that area has decreased. And then you can also see in the middle where the thinning has happened, that it hasn't thinned uniformly, which is what you see from satellites, but instead has these crevasses that are thinning through the ice faster, which suggests the Eastern Ice Shelf is gonna collapse soon. Since then, there's uh, since we published this paper, there's also been groups who have gone down with robots that have gone underneath the ice shelf and have seen and explored these crevasses and shown that same process at play. But all that to say the Eastern uh, Ice Shelf is probably not gonna be the permanent divide setting uh, the space between Pine Island and Twain's. Uh, my students also, I'm very proud, uh, made a tool uh, to explore this data. It's live now, so you can participate in citizen science or recreational science, help us look through all these uh, film scans on the bottom and quality control, tiny little digits that uh, help us see where they are and connect them to the positioning data we have. Um, we've also partnered with uh, Nana Carlson and folks from the Technical University of Denmark and have scanned their film as well. So you can go on there and uh, look at archival data from both Antarctica and Greenland. Okay, so that's sort of how things are right now using uh, ice penetrating radar. You can also ask what will govern change in the future? Um, my former PhD student, Eliza, who's now a postdoc at Georgia Tech, you know, when she was first starting out, I asked her this question, I said, okay, look, there are these areas like in the radar data and the actually model on the left, again, at the boundary of Thwaites, right by the coast that are frozen, both in the data and the model. I said, okay, what if this little piece of ground thaws? And to her credit, she asked a much bigger question and say, okay, what if areas that are frozen in the ice sheet thaw? And she came up with these sort of three categories, all ice sheet wise. She said, said these areas that were frozen and sort of deeply frozen, that you could imagine would be difficult to thaw. And she had these sort of thawable reasons which were which were frozen, but like by a polite amount, like you could imagine, you know, a couple of degrees, maybe even up to 12 degrees that you could imagine the, something changing that could cause thawing. And then you had areas that were already thawed. And she went through a, a series of modeling experiments to say, okay, each of these areas, if I change the friction of these thawable areas, how will the ice sheet respond? And these charts show different levels of thawing and how much ice loss you would get. And so there's areas like Sipo Coast, which are very dynamic and interesting, but uh, with the thaw, very little change at all. You have areas like the Amundsen Sea that actually for small amounts of thawing 
you know, some increase, but the areas mostly thawed. And then you have this areas like Wilkesland that are not losing a lot of mass right now, but with thaw could increase a lot. So this is identified an area of the ice sheet where things are in that sort of thawable regime where the geometry is such that you could imagine putting up some big numbers and ice loss if those areas were to thaw. Eliza then went through and looked at radar data in a follow-on paper across the coast in this region. She found in this logistic regression classification here that in these ice plug regions that have been found before, these areas of the bed that if you remove them, you could imagine triggering unstable retreat, that it was a mixed condition. It wasn't all the way thawed. It wasn't all the way frozen. It's in this intermediate state. And again, that's the most vulnerable state. If it was already thawed, things would already be happening. Or if they weren't happening, thawing wouldn't have triggered it. If it was deeply frozen, it would be hard to abandon triggering then. So that was one takeaway from this paper. The other is when you look at these uh, ice sheet model basal conditions from various state-of-the-art ice sheet models, you can see that their bed conditions thermally differ from each other tremendously. So now as part of her postdoc, she's working on work to try and use these uh, radar classifications as a constraint in how ice sheet models are spun up. So maybe that's your, your worldview. Maybe thawing pieces of the bed are the key trigger to uh, what could cause things to retreat, maybe put up some of those bigger numbers we know in the past. Say, so, okay, I, you know, I'm sort of persuaded by that, but what could change this? Um, that's a question of ocean forcing. This is where uh, we have a new uh, graduate student joining our group and actually Chloe Chang, who's a, an undergrad who's done some impressive work, trying to look at signatures still in radar because we're still a radar group of warm water coming in uh, from the ocean and interacting with the ice sheet. So Chloe's done some work with using commercial SAR data to try and classify sea ice uh, size distributions to get some constraints on temperatures that way. Uh, and then we also have some work in doing repeat sounding of grounding zones to see a mixture of brighter and dimmer signatures in the radar that are associated with ocean water getting inland at the grounding level. So maybe that's the piece that persuades you. Uh, maybe you think the ocean's not really driving things. Maybe you think it's just like a big, dumb source of heat and what's really happening are internal dynamics like subglacial hydrology. Uh, we have another uh, just starting PhD student, today's first day of the quarter, uh, Sun Mi, who's working on subglacial hydrology. And she's looking at the offshore record that has these areas of bedrock channels that are carved into the continental shelf that suggest perhaps over multiple glacial cycles, uh, concentrated subglacial water has flown in the same direction. When you look at uh, contemporary models of Thwaites, we see that concentrated water exerts a lot of control on the current configuration of Thwaites. And so if you put these two pictures together, it starts to ask, does the subglacial topography, both as an expression and as a force to capture subglacial concentrated water, set a template that perhaps the, the contemporary version of Thwaites has a lot in common with previous versions of Thwaites, perhaps even in previous glaciations. Okay, maybe you're like, okay, I'm persuaded by that. Uh, but I think uh, I'm much more interested in a warming world where Antarctica looks more like Greenland. And I don't think it's the ocean. I don't think it's internal dynamics. I think it's the atmosphere and surface melt that's really going to drive things. Well, we know in Greenland that that's the case. We see big ponds, big giant lakes of surface melt that drain to the bottom. Uh, a group participated in an experiment to look at a year long or at least summer to winter, spring to winter deployment of a stationary radar imaging system. We had thought what we would be seeing there is looking at vertical layers and their motion downward to see the response to the drainage event. But what we saw instead was this giant 50 dB drop in power of both the layers in the bed. Again, 50 dB is like 10 to the fifth. This is giant. You could be wrong about a lot of stuff. And what all the colored plots show is that the amount of water that the ice sheet would have had to hold on to to cause that attenuation is like most of the water. So what was happening is you were getting the melt, the ice sheet was holding on to it, and even into the winter, it was holding on to that. So that was a surprising result for us. My former student, uh, Riley Kohlberg, who's faculty at Cornell now, asked a broader question on that to both understand that process and look at these warm events that at that time were making the news. Perhaps you remember in 2012 when, quote, all of Greenland melted. It's not that all of Greenland as an ice sheet melted, but like everywhere on the surface was above melting at the same time. And at the time we had thought, okay, well, maybe the ice sheet's sort of a big, dumb, low pass filter that's sort of not that sensitive to a single extreme melt season. When Riley looked at the 
higher resolution data in their surface though, what he saw was you had this ice layer that had formed in that melt event. And as he looked as time went on, what you got was an ice layer that, that reduced permeability of the near surface and grew. And that makes sense, right? You had previous melt that would sort of percolate in, but when you had this large melt event, you formed a layer of ice, the percolation in following even normal years would reach that ice, not percolate through and grow. And you have this feedback of reducing permeability. So that combination of the previous result in the field experiment and Riley's remote sensing data opens up a picture of the near surface where extreme melt events change permeability, change the way that surface melt reaches the base. So maybe that's the piece you think will change that sheet going forward. So that's most of the pictures we've got of both thinking about how the ice sheet is right now and how you could imagine looking at forcings in the future using ice penetrating radar. So in the beginning, our group does both uh, geophysics and engineering. We also do terrestrial and planetary studies. Uh, one of the benefits of having both those in the same spot was this paper that came out of this Greenland Double Ridge study. My former postdoc, Gregor Steinbrugge, who's at JPL as a research scientist now, was giving a group talk and presented this Europa Double Ridge image there. It's one of the most uh, common uh, pervasive service features on Europa. And Riley had happened to be looking this morning at radiograms, uh, or that morning at radiograms like that on the right, where you saw uh, he saw a double ridge feature in the surface over a water body. And then when we requested some higher resolution imagery, we saw the double ridge in, in the optical imagery as well. So this was this incredible window of a double ridge feature that we were lucky enough to also have a time series of it being formed in the radar data. So this put for, allowed us to put forward a hypothesis that we would have never dared to put forward if we didn't see it in action, but actually explains a lot about Europa. And so what you see is this time series of the formation of the double ridge and the radar data at the, at the top and the mechanism which this shows, uh, we believe, uh, playing out in Greenland in the near surface. So what you get is a body of water that's stuck on an impermeable layer. In Greenland, this is the fern to ice transition. In Europa, it would be sort of the regolith uh, to, to uh, sub-regolith ice. But you get a spot where you can perch some water in the near surface. It starts to freeze. As it freezes, it pressurizes and it jams water up in the middle. As that water freezes, that becomes now reduced permeability, you get freezing again, and now water's jammed up on either side. And you get these ridges that sort of balance each other like a scale because they're still in touch with the water at the bottom. So this is a hypothesis that came out. And this was a, a really exciting case where uh, a terrestrial analog process that came out of a group uh, from having people doing both uh, in the same spot. Our group also does intentional uh, planetary radioglaciology. So everything I've talked about so far, all these analysis approaches, the ambiguity of attenuation and reflectivity, those all are at play if you use satellite data. Most of the airborne data I've shown you used uh, radar systems that were like 10 kilowatts flying like hundreds of meters over the surface. In a planetary setting, you're using like tens of watts, hundreds of kilometers above the surface. Uh, this is obviously more challenging, but you remember from the earlier slides, that the colder ice is, the less attenuating it is, and space is very cold. Uh, so that's that's hopeful. Um, the RIME radar on uh, ESA's JUICE mission is already on its way to the Jupiter system, and REASON, which is on Europa Clipper, is meant to launch in a couple weeks. With the REASON radar on Europa Clipper, we're trying to answer a couple big questions. Um, one of the questions is just how thick is the ice shell? So you can imagine in that case, you'd like to see through the whole ice shell and measure the thickness of the ice ocean interface. Um, one of the challenges when we were designing this radar is how to choose the center frequency. If you're more scared of surface roughness, which makes total sense, the surface is rough, you'd wanna go down in frequency to have really long wavelengths. However, it happens to be the case that particles ejected from volcanoes on the moon Io that interact uh, with Jupiter's a uh, magnetic field produces super strong radiation at those low frequencies and long wavelengths. And so if the uh, if that source of uh, radio energy is pointing at you, it totally blasts your, your lower frequency data. So the reason radar has both bands, so it can hopefully work well in one of the bands at each point around the moon. 
there's also this question of attenuation of how far you see through. And uh, so this is one of my little soapboxes, which is people often want to ask you, what is the penetration depth of your radar? Like they were buying a camera at Best Buy. And the thing is, it's, it's not mostly up to the radar, it's mostly up to the moon. So for example, if you look at this plot here, you could imagine, uh, say we have 100 dB to work with, we can look at that solid black line. And if you start to go down that curve of that plot on the right, you can see you sort of hit that black line at the ocean, maybe 15 kilometers. You say, okay, look, you can see through 15 kilometers, that's your penetration depth. What are you gonna do if the ice shell is 30 kilometers thick? Well, if you look at the right side of that plot, you see, you know, you don't hit that line to like 28 kilometers, which is more than 15. So the real answer of like, what's your penetration depth is most of the way, which makes sense because space is cold and the ocean is warm. And so you're making it through the cold ice and into some of the warm ice. So if you take nothing else, away from this talk, you know, you can't use the term penetration depth for radar sounders. It's up to the target and the sounder together. Anyway, okay, off the soapbox. If, if you're not convinced by that, and you're like, look, I don't buy it. I want to see ice ocean interface, you know, or we're not going to see all the way down uh, under all conditions of all moons. Then you can take some comfort in the fact that a lot of recent papers have shown that there should be liquid water, at least sometimes in the ice shell. So whether it's uh, shallow melt lenses under chaos terrains, uh, the formation of impact melt features where you have an impact, there's heat and you have liquid water temporarily there, or this double ridge form in the process of Riley's work, all of those would be water in the ice shell, in the colder portion of the ice shell, that because it's colder and shallower, it's easier to get through, you would get a reflection. Now, the challenge with this is how confident are you going to be that what you see is a subsurface water body that could you know, be a, a habitable place for life? Um, your hope will be that you see a nice sharp picture like the top right there on the bottom of an iceberg uh, beneath the chaos terrain, which you see in the sort of left panel of the top right picture. Uh, the challenge is when you're doing flybys, how do you know an echo is coming from below and not to the side? And so in this case, uh, we also have a two channel system on reason where you can use the phase difference from echoes from the side versus below to know that what you're seeing is indeed a subsurface water body and not just a badly placed pathological ridge. Okay, in addition to shallow water, I think it's important to realize that the radar sending data, when we get there, is going to say a lot more than just here's the ice ocean interface or here's some water in the middle. And there's a couple of signatures that I think we'll see no matter what, if they're there, that are way shallower to have much more favorable attenuation budgets. And so these are two of them are pore closure and eutectic melt. So pore closure, you can imagine Europa has a regolith on the top. It's cold. Eventually ice gets warmer, it starts to flow, and then the pores get smaller. So even if you get there and you just see like fuzz from volume scattering of the radar from the near surface, and then eventually at some depth it goes away, that gives you a constraint on the temperature where ice starts to flow and those pores get smaller. And so you can see on the left here, if you look at all of these possible curves of ice temperature profiles, which is gray, those are all the possible things it could be in this particular model. And then you put a constraint on what are the temperatures where that ice pore curing would happen. You can see that that single observation of the fuzz in a way reduces the range of thicknesses that you could see. On the right, you see a much more powerful constraint from eutectic melt. This is where if you have salty ice melts at a warmer temperature, colder temperature than non-salty ice. And so if you see something, you say, okay, there's an echo, maybe nothing, 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 and boom, an echo. You say, I am going to attribute that or interpret that as coming from the eutectic. Then you can place a much tighter constraint and you can see on the right, that constrains the thickness of the temperature profile. So this is to prepare people to say that if you, even if you just see something like fuzz, nothing, and then boom, isolated echo, that constrains a lot about your ice shell. You don't need to see the ice ocean interface everywhere. Once you realize how powerful, and I think that plot really shows it, the detection of a eutectic echo is, then you can start to imagine constraining even more about the ice shell. So this plot on the left is an example of uh, the isotherm of eutectic here. So this is uh, the temperature at which that eutectic would exist for different circulation uh, patterns of convection in the ice shell. And you can see there's those two lines. The dashed line is that pore closure. You see it doesn't really express the shape of the convection. You can see there the black line does. So that's a window deeper. So now this, my newest student, 
um, Annie Chang, who just started in, uh, in a physics PhD. Her work is working on trying to understand what is that signature the eutectus is going to give you at you when you get melt. So uh, we've been looking at some of the experimental work on brine networks in veins and ice and terrestrial temperate ice. And you can see that they have a shape to them. And Annie's early work here on the right shows that the reflection coefficient you get from different shapes, whether that melt is spheres or whether they're sort of needles or lines that are aligned perpendicular or, uh, or parallel to the radar signal, you get stronger or weaker reflection. So we're going to try and understand this so we have a better constraint so that we can map uh, the internal dynamics of the ice shell or place this very strong constraint on the right on ice shell thickness when we get there. Okay. So now, you know, in the beginning, I said our group also invents new ways to observe ice sheets. So I'll talk a little bit about some of our instrumentation work here. Um, the first was also sort of inspired in the opposite direction by planetary sounding. You know, I, I mentioned uh, that Europe is really loud at radio frequencies. So my, my very first PhD student, Sean Peters, who's, who's also at the University of Colorado now, uh, did his PhD on passive radar sounding, where you could use ambient radio noise in the environment. In his case, he was uh, starting off thinking about uh, the Europa mission, where we have Jovian emissions, but showed we could also use the sun. So in this case, you use the random radio fluctuations of the sun, you cross-correlate it with each other, and then you get a peak in that cross-correlation, very similar to passive seismic uh, tomography. And so he built this system, demonstrated it, that, that echo in the bottom right is an echo from the bottom of Storr Glacier in Greenland using just the sun as a, an, as a source. So this is useful both when we get to Europa with Europa Clipper, when there's uh, noise at the HF bands, we can do this type of sounding. And also in terms of mission concepts, both first and planetary settings where you could build a radar where you don't need a transmitter, you can use ambient signals in the environment. So in the opposite direction, uh, my former student, Anna Broom, who's now at Sandia National Lab, uh, developed a radar sounder that was both a radar sounder ground-based system and a radiometer. Both of these things are sensitive to the temperature of the ice sheet. They're both ways to sort of uh, constrain ice sheet temperature profiles with the radiometer due to both black body radiation and attenuation, and in the radar case from attenuation itself, Anna showed that they're sensitive to different depths. The radar sounder is sensitive deeper to warmer ice. The radiometer is sensitive shallower, but, but measures the shape of the profile. And when you put them together, they constrain it better. Uh, this was interesting in her case, initially for an instrument development point of view, but now it's interesting as the there are missions and concepts in both the US and in Europe for a terrestrial uh, sort of wideband radiometer for ice sheet temperatures. And it's also super interesting in a planetary setting where there's Juno uh, radiometer data over Europa that we'll then analyze in combination with uh, the Clipper radar when we get there. In terms of the instruments themselves and ways we can observe the ice sheet going forward, you know, I showed you earlier uh, those three lines of like archival data and then data slightly later. I mean, every time we see subsurface conditions with the time series, they get much richer. So I think we need to get in a spot where it's easier and cheaper and more democratized to uh, collect time series radar sounding data. My senior engineering student, Thomas Teisberg, uh, during his PhD, developed this fixed wing radar sounder, um, the Peregrine system. This is a hand launch system. It flies 25 kilometers, collects sounding data, like you can see on the right there. This is in Svalbard. Um, initially, he did tests on campus during COVID, which actually is a much harder permit to get than Iceland or Svalbard or Greenland or Antarctica. And he's currently in the process of extending this uh, in collaboration with uh, Jamie Greenbaum at Scripps to have much bigger platforms that can go further. Um, but in addition to the ease of going and collecting data in a time series way, this also opens up the ability to do interferometric vertical velocity from these hand launch systems and other radar sounding systems. So Thomas is also working on this paper that shows how you can extend surface velocities. So, you know, using the phase and inside, this is really common. One of the workhorses of glaciology now, these surface velocities to then add using these layers inside the ice sheet, a vertical component to get you 3D velocities of the ice sheet. So that to me is one of the most exciting things that comes from having the ability to just collect time series data at a lower cost. 
Again, all these uh, radar systems we developed, Anna's Mapper Radar Radiometer System, Thomas's uh, Peregrine Airborne System, and also uh, a, a bi-static system that Danny was using earlier on the ice sheet margin. All of these are part of an open source uh, hardware uh, collection we've put together and it's on our website. And so if you want to buy a software defined radio and start developing your own radar sounder, you can go on there and get started from there. Finally, I'll add uh, the sort of most forward-looking thing our group is doing now in terms of instrument is uh, both uh, Danny, my geophysics student, and an and incoming EE PhD student are working on, and many undergrads this summer, very impressively actually, uh, are working on developing a giant radar frequency over fiber array. I like to imagine maybe like a radio telescope array, but downward through the ice sheet that could allow us to make 3D images, sort of like an ultrasound, both of bed forms being eroded, of ice flow itself, of uh, of ice shelf melt on the bottom. And then the most challenging application, which I think is really fun to aspire to, is to try and measure uplift underneath the ice sheet. So we know that there are these uh, glacial isostatic uplift signals of sort of millimeters a year. It's super challenging if you put uh, a GPS signal on top of the ice, because you have fern compaction, you have ice flow, you have melt. Can you correct for all of this to pull out that signal? And I think if we have a crazy enough, big enough array, out there long enough, I do think we can probably do it. And, and the work that's going into this right now, especially uh, the undergrad work is, is trying to build radically low cost transceivers that turn the uh, light signal into radio signals, perhaps without amplification, and also ways to receive the signal uh, without power on an antenna that could then allow us to really imagine putting out like hundreds of antennas over a network of fiber. So that's our current fun forward-looking mad scientist instrument. Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to spend the remaining 50 minutes sort of taking questions or diving deeper on any one of these topics. Thank you, Professor Schroeder. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat and I will read it out loud. Um, or everyone should be able to just unmute themselves. So you can go ahead and ask, ask a question. Uh, so I, I got a question. Um, so um, very nice talk. Um, so given the uh, the GMSS satellites uh, that are already over there, um, um, for example, there have been like the Cygnus constellation there using the, the GMSS reflected signal. Um, of course, we know that the, the GMSS signal um, is maybe not work well for the high latitude. But do you think is uh, is there any possibility there for the GMSS signal to be received and to study the ice sheet? I think for really shallow targets, that's extremely promising, and we certainly in our passive radar work take the GNSS reflectometry work as, as an inspiration. Um, the challenge is for most sounding settings, the sort of frequencies we're using are like one megahertz or up to. 400 megahertz, or in maybe some cases, we've seen some things into the low gigahertz. Um, but that is the challenge, is the, the link budget to see all the way through at those shorter wavelengths of GNSS is, is tough. Um, and so I think we're sort of looking at other signals and other satellites or other uh, systems that, that operate more in the megahertz or tens of megahertz regime. To, to see to the bottom of the ice sheets. But shallow stuff, I think you should definitely be able to do that way. I see. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Or comments? It doesn't have to be a question. Thank you, Professor Schroeder, for the talk. I have a question about um, any close to surface missions to Europa. Um, maybe that was the purpose of Europa Clipper, um, similar to how there was a helicopter on the surface of Mars to look at the, the surface. Yeah, I mean, there certainly uh, is a lot of enthusiasm to have uh, a follow on lander mission. Um, and there was periods there where we thought maybe they would be quite close to each other in time. It looks like the way it's playing out is that Clipper will go first and, and landers will follow. 
Um, but I know there's lots of people who are excited about that and interested in both, you know, things just on the surface and people working on melt probes. And, you know, I think in, in the most exciting of all worlds, you would imagine uh, Clipper itself would find water pockets that perhaps are not that deep. And you could imagine sending a melt probe to go and, and sample them. That would be amazing. So I think follow on mission is, is, is when it would happen. But, uh, but yeah, I think we're all very excited about imagining that. Thank you. Do we have any more before we go ahead and let Professor Shorter continue with his day? Okay. Well, unless I am interrupted, which, um, you know, feel free to do that. <laughs> um, I think we can conclude today's talk. So thank you everybody for coming and thank you, Professor Shorter, for giving us this talk. Um, as always, um, our seminar series will continue same time. Oh, not same time. Um, next week, we are in person. Um, so our in-person seminars are at noon. Um, so that'll be in the email that John sends, um, just as a, as a, as a reference. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Schroeder, for giving us this talk. Um, and we will have uh, the recording up on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. I think you need that link just let John or I know. But thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming.